And then you go over there and look and you're screaming like a little girl running across the yard, you know? <laughs> Not that I would do that. I was talking about yeah. you, David. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, hacking into my webcams. <laughs> You're listening to the Help Me With HIPAA podcast, where HIPAA and humor collide to make learning fun. Your delightful hosts are Donna Grindle and David Sims. Relax, HIPAA help is on the way. Welcome everyone to episode 16 of Help Me With HIPAA. I am super excited to be here today with Donna Grindle, my co-host, called her my guest host last time <laughs> she yeah, yeah. got all over me <laughs> so <laughs> how are you doing donna i'm doing great today david i am excited awesome. to be with you too as long you as it's be. you know across the internet and then, yeah don't want to be too close to each other <laughs> <laughs> yeah i like it that way so today we're going to look at uh seven steps for nurturing a culture of compliance and what we found through a mutual friend that runs a company called AMS and has a product called Sphere. And we interviewed him on a past podcast, but we found on his website a nice little PDF file that talked about the seven steps to improving your practice, privacy, and security policies and procedures. Man, it's a lot of P's there. Yeah. <laughs> and so part of that is nurturing that compliance. And, and we kind of hear that term thrown around a lot, the culture of compliance, but we want to kind of break that down into seven easy steps that you can take to nurture that and to bring that into your, to your workplace, to your practice or your business, depending on whether you're a CE or a BA. So let's, uh, let's dive onto that. How about that? Dive in. Dive onto it. Dive yeah, onto well, you can dive it. in it. Yeah, dive like a hand grenade, just dive on it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take an hand grenade for you, David. Go on without me. <laughs> <laughs> so the first one is designate a compliance officer, which is privacy officer and security officer. And in some cases we've talked about before, those could be the same person. And most times if it's a small organization, they, that will be the same person. So talk a little bit about the designation of that compliance officer. Well, and also in a business associate, you can have just the security officer, but they have to understand the privacy parts of the business associate requirement. A lot of people only worry about a business associate doing the security rule things, and we've talked about that before. But in a covered entity environment, they have to have one of each. Technically, it can be the same person. And what we run into is in a small environment, everybody's already got 20 jobs, and now I need to pick one person and give them two more or spread it out or, you know, how can we spread the wealth? Because we have so much fun work to do. Mm -hmm. But the law says you got to do it. So the important thing to remember is it's a legal requirement, but mostly because if that job isn't designated to somebody to make sure it's being done, we all know what happens. And it won't get done. It won't get done. <laughs> if, if no one's watching and no one's measuring and no one's constantly thinking about it at some level, then nothing's going to happen. So in order to actually nurture your culture of compliance, you got to have somebody in charge of doing that. And we've actually had, a, you know, we go in and we say, let's figure out what works best in your environment for your management. And there are times where you go in and they've just randomly picked somebody that's going to be the privacy officer and the security officer. And then you start asking a lot of questions and the security officer knows nothing about technology. Not going to be effective most of the time, I would think. What about you, David? Yeah, that's going to be tough. Some of the security measures require, I mean, a minimal level anyway of kind of understanding the technology side of things. Yeah. Unless you just happen to have a an IT provider, an MSP that can, you know, you really trust. Maybe you've had them for a while or or you've been referred to one, but you know, they'll sit down with you and, and really help you. They should. They should help you with this stuff. If they're not a just proper HIPAA compliant IT provider. Right. Right. And they should help you with that and sit down and kind of go over that. And you should be able to ask them questions and then provide you answers that you can understand. Right. Uh, that's that's the hardest part of an IT person's job yeah. is speaking is English. Explaining. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Get away from the geek speak and, and all that. 
and and break it down where somebody can understand it. Yeah, and that makes the job require more time. So it's always uh, advantageous to take someone that at least feels exceptionally comfortable at the computer. And every office has that person who they're whatever manager really feels most comfortable with the computer. Sometimes it's the youngest person in the office. I don't know. But you want someone that has at least the respect of the whole group because if they're the low man on the totem pole, you know that's not going to help. And they have a little bit of technical quotient in their in in their understanding. Then it's important to pick somebody with those skills and that ability and that, I don't know, level of respect, I think matters in your office so that they are the ones that are in charge of understanding what you're supposed to do and making sure that you're doing it. That's it. That's all they're supposed to do. And then on the privacy side, now you're getting into very intricate details about how your office functions and what kinds of information you work with. Do you have research? What kind of marketing do you do? What kinds of scenarios will you run into just in your normal processing environment of treating patients and taking their information and talking with them about the clinical side of things? This is huge. So now you want someone who understands your practice and understands every element of it because they're the ones that have to watch after the data as where we're going to send it and what we're going to do with it. The other person says, how can we protect it and allow us to move it when we need to and receive it when we need to? The person that decides what you're going to actually do with it when you get it that's the privacy officer. So it's key that that person is a relatively high level of management who really understands your business in order to deal with all the questions that'll come up because the questions are privacy questions. The technology questions that come up, you know, that's that's pretty straightforward. The system's going to be configured this way or this way, or we need to make that change or this change, or we add an application. The privacy ones, those are the ones that are intricate and take a very long time to figure out sometimes. So that doesn't need to be a technical person. It needs to be somebody that really understands your business. And it's worth saying, uh, and I know the people that are security officers and, and IT people are going to probably shout when I say this, but it's worth saying that security and convenience do not go hand in hand most of the time. <laughs> yeah. <But, you> know, <laughs> uh, yeah, I run into this a lot when I'm doing security stuff and, and you know, I'm sure you have two, somebody calls you up and they're like, why do we have to have these passwords? Or, you know, why can't I know Sylvia's password? And, you know, just all these things that are put into place to, to make your network more secure and to protect that information those things require you to, to jump through some hoops and it's not convenient. No. But it's necessary. Yes, very much so. So the security officer has to deal with all, all of those questions and that frustration. So it helps to have a person who is patient. <laughs> <laughs> well, it also, and you, you alluded to it, but it also is it's a requirement that upper management is involved in this. Otherwise, you know, you're going to have people that are lower down that are trying to enforce things. And, you know, maybe the the upper management's not doing the same thing because they're not taking part in it. And of course, when employees see upper management not doing it, they're, they're not going to do it. Right. It's the direction. I mean, you know, it's always a years ago, I had a mentor and uh, uh, one of my managers who was teaching me and uh I always love the guy. And he said, you have to remember, it doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't matter whether it's the way you dress, the way you carry yourself, or the way your work ethic is. If you're in charge, everyone else below you is going to do just less than that. Mm, That's scary. (laughs) I know. But you think about it. They're going, you know, it's always that same conversation is the ones that will float to the top won't be with you forever or you're really fortunate. You know, because Mm -hmm. if they knew how to do what I knew how to do, they'd be doing what I do, which is not working for me. (laughs) 
<laughs> you know, so it, it's that whole thing of you're going to experience that. So we try to teach, we go into doctor's meetings all the time and try to do some education just on that concept that it does matter what you're doing. If you're not worrying about it, they're going to follow that lead. And that mm-hmm. is why having someone that's in charge of the privacy and the security, they're going to be the ones that are constantly trying to remind everybody that that's what needs to be done. And they're also the ones that everybody has to know, if you have a question, this is who you go to. So, And we actually have cases where, to spread the wealth, so to speak, they identify a privacy officer, a security officer, and then at the management level, one of the partners in the firm or whatever, or the organization, will become the compliance officer. So they're responsible for making sure that whatever the privacy and security officers say they need, it's handled at that high level. The C level is the, you know, the buzzwords that you use. But that way there's an individual that's at that level in those meetings saying, hey, this is what's going on in privacy and security and this is what we need to worry about. So it is very helpful to have that other level, but then have the best person for the job doing the privacy and security work in a smaller environment. You know, you you go to a large environment and they have a compliance department, which is just outside the realm of understanding for anybody in, you know, in our level of the businesses that we work with. Right. So there you go. So step number two, train and educate your staff and your BA partners, which I find very refreshing that that's in there. Yeah. So let's discuss that. We got excited when we read that, didn't we? (laughs) I did. That's, you know, the fact that somebody's recognizing that because we preach that, you know, you should not only do your training and do your education, but you need to also make sure you put some pressure on your business associates to make sure they're doing the right thing. Because as you and I know, (laughs) there's a lot of people out there that say they're HIPAA compliant, but they're not. When you start doing your due diligence, you find out. And I have found some small companies and I have found some big companies, both, <laughs> yeah. that aren't doing anything, but they're advertising that they are. And unless you dig, you're not going to find out. So, you know, a lot of that is a misunderstanding. Going back to the people that believe all I got to worry about is do the security stuff. You know, it's just like PCI compliance. We got this. It's just like this. We got this. And it's not. It requires so many other things and a deeper understanding of the data that's flowing through your systems. And so, yes, business partners, as we talked about before, that due diligence can be very eye-opening. You're like, wait, Mm -hmm. you didn't know you're supposed to do this? You know, like my favorite. Well, obviously... You take HIPAA compliance more seriously than we do. (laughs) Yeah, I usually get, uh, when I send those out, I usually get something like, is this really necessary? Or this is kind of extreme, don't you think? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Like, it's just questions. It's not. They're not complicated. They're things like, do you know you're supposed (laughs) to do this? Do you have training? Do you do a risk analysis? I mean, we don't ask them things that are (laughs) extreme. We're asking you exactly the things that the law says you're supposed to be doing. Are you doing it? Well, that's extreme. Don't you think overkill? Yeah. We can't tell you that's a private uh, Uh, Proprietary information. Yeah, there you go. There you go. You have to sign a non-disclosure agreement. Yeah, I'm not telling (laughs) you that. It's proprietary. (laughs) No. But definitely having the BAs, sometimes it's a matter for a covered entity to train their business associate to understand what all of that means, to answer that question. No, it's not overkill, because obviously, if you think it is, then we've got a lot of talking to do. And we've had cases where you go into the business associate and you start asking questions and it's like, oh, well, they're not using our HIPAA compliance system. We need to move them. You know, you never know exactly what you're going to find. It's like a box of chocolates. (laughs) (laughs) Go ahead, Forrest. (laughs) Run, Forrest, run. So... When you start asking those business partners, you're going to need to do some training in a lot of cases. But your Mm -hmm. own internal training, we've talked over and over about the importance of not just doing a annual training and blah, 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 blah. Here's what the law is. Because if people don't hear it over and over, they forget it. 
they don't worry about it. It's the things they deal with day in and day out that are important to them and that they worry about. Mm -hmm. And yes, there needs to be training, but the thing that a lot of people miss is you're also supposed to do security awareness training. So not just do a HIPAA training, but do security awareness training that says, did you know that this could be a big problem? Let's talk about phishing emails today and how do you recognize them? And we talk about questions. They smell funny. Huh? They smell funny. Oh, God. Here you go. There goes my train of thought. It just ran right off the track. Yeah, just blew it all out of the water. (laughs) (laughs) I'll say one thing on the training part is stay tuned. That's all I'll say. Just stay Stay tuned. tuned. There's something to that training part. Stay tuned. (laughs) We always have things in the works often for people because, you know, we do like to have a house over our head and Lord knows you need one. (laughs) 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 But back to uh, the topic at hand, the train that went off the tracks on training is that there's more to a training program than having somebody come in once a year and spout out what the rules say and what you're supposed to do for 45 minutes while everybody eats lunch. That used to be the way to do it. It just can't happen that way anymore. So you have to have a real training program and the actual nurturing of a culture of compliance where we're talking about in this element is if you're actually training on a regular basis, then your people are going to be more involved in the compliance process. They're going to be more actively monitoring things that are happening around them. And we talked before about it's the people, people, Mm -hmm. you know, it's the people. So it's important to make sure that you have all of that going on. And most of the um, people in marketing, I always heard the marketing teams and the sales teams would always tell us, I'm like, are y'all ever going to change this stupid flyer? Because it's saying the same thing. And we say the same thing over here and we say the same thing over there. And it's really just getting annoying. It's boring. And, you know, I've heard it over and over and over. And they go, great. That means you're actually know it now. Because once you reach that point where you've heard it so many times, it starts to annoy you. Now I've got the message across. Until then, I may not have gotten the message across. Right. So yes, there has to be more to it than just, hey, everybody, don't forget HIPAA. So step three, implement an ongoing solution for maintaining your compliance. Well, this our episode on documentation. And what's your favorite phrase on documentation, David? You didn't document it, it didn't happen. That's right. If I can't pull out a document a year from now with the details of what occurred, then it didn't happen. So we have to have a lot of documentation, plus we have to have a compliance plan. So you're supposed to have your risk management plan. You're supposed to do your audits. You're supposed to document your incidents. You're supposed to document, of course, your policies and procedures and the decisions you're making with your policies and procedures, as well as documenting all of your uh, business associates that we just talked about. We have to make sure we have the contracts for them and we have done our due diligence and we document that information so that we know what's going on in our compliance program. So there's a million ways you can do that. We generally believe in using tools because we're technical people. Our first ideas are always going to be, how can I use the computer to manage a whole bunch of data? Mm -hmm. We always say, why am I getting paper? (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) There's paper, there's time for paper, but It's really not the way a three-ring binder is not a compliance maintenance solution. Not anymore. In fact, uh, I was reading an article about a breach where a, uh, I think it was an oral surgeon said they went into their law firm. I think, well, it was after they'd had a breach and they went to see their lawyer and they brought in their three-ring binders and their lawyer laughed at him and said, this is not enough. This is not what you need. So having a solution where you can pull that information appropriately and it's not just a bunch of binders anymore, we've gone way beyond that. Mm -hmm. And we use tools like Comply Assistant, and we're going to be talking to them and doing an interview with them uh, 
in a couple of weeks. And then uh, Sphere, where we just talked to Ray about what his stuff does. And then using a professional MSP, which you want to revamp what an MSP is, David? Right. Um, MSP is a managed services provider. And I know they use that in different areas, but I'm referring to it as being IT. I have seen managed services in other areas, right. but it's a, when we talk about MSP, we mean a HIPAA compliant IT company that does managed services, which is monitoring and, and maintenance and, uh, you know, remote support and things like that on an ongoing basis. They're there to do the same job that you want done, which is to keep things running, not to call them when something breaks and, and only have them come out then. So they're right. working toward the same end result as you are. And they can generate reports on, they have tools to generate reports on the status of your computers automatically. So they're mm-hmm. not going from computer to computer and writing down what the antivirus status is. That's not the kind of stuff we're talking about. We're talking about a maintenance solution where this stuff can happen without paying for people to run around and do it because, again, it's the people people. Mm-hmm. So. And it's typically a lot uh, less expensive to do that, even to, even less expensive than having a part-time person come in and do these things. Yeah. You can have a, a contract with an MSP, save you tons of time and save you money and get all types of monitoring and management and reports and they can um, – Lots of times they can catch problems before they actually become problems that affect your business. So it's just a good way to cover a lot of the things that you need. Right. So there is more to what we're talking about with compliance maintenance than three ring binders and a couple of folders. It's many tools that work together or that create documentation that goes into a central place. And if you don't want to use tools, because some people are like, oh, I can use it. I can do it. My spreadsheets, my documents, my folders. That's great. Do it somehow. But you need to do all of those things. Just keep in mind, you've got to have what is my plan. i got to be able to show you my long-term plan. I've got to be able to have the projects broken down and assigned to people so I know who's doing things because there's no way that one person can do all of the things that have to be done. You have to be able to you know, outsource it or even delegate it within your organization. But you still need to know what's going to happen and when and who's in charge. So Mm -hmm. all of that, you can do it within whatever systems you have, but you need to do it. And you need to have that plan and everybody know what it is and everybody know where to get it. And that brings us perfectly into step four, which is to conduct regular and complete audits and monitoring of all EPHI. Yeah, because we all know if you ain't looking, then who knows what's going to happen. It's just one of those things where the, you know, when the, cats away, the mice will play. (laughs) Yeah. Well, there's a a ton of things that can happen and you won't know unless you're having things that are audited and monitored. I can give you a perfect example. Uh, A couple of years ago, I had a a chiropractic office that they just had a, a basic router that you would pick up from you know, Best Buy or Walmart or somewhere. And they were using this router and I had come in and I was talking to them about, about security. And this is You know, before I got really involved with HIPAA, I was just looking at it from a security standpoint. And I was telling them about, you know, all the things that they weren't able to catch because they were just using the regular router. So we put in a threat management device, which was able to go in and start monitoring what was coming in and what was happening within their network. And they were getting, if I remember correctly, they were getting somewhere around 1,800 attempts a day at somebody breaking into their network from the outside. Nice. Um, and we eventually got that down to zero, but it was, you know, it floored the doctor. He was like, why would anybody want to break into my equipment? Everybody has that, that same, why would it happen to me? Or yeah. it won't happen to me type syndrome is what I call it. Yeah. And, and that's the way it was. He's like, he's like, nobody's messing around trying to get into my stuff. And then when I put that monitoring on there, it was like, holy cow. You know, 1,800 times a day, somebody's trying to get into his, yeah, which his network. It, when you think your uh, systems are slow, it often has to do with how much somebody's pounding away trying to get in. That's eating up your resources because your resources are busy blocking them and hopefully mm-hmm. not letting them in. But still, your resources are busy blocking them. So auditing yeah. and monitoring is how you find the problems, and then you're able to fix them. And in most cases, 
it's even something as simple as, you know, after everybody's gone home for the day, just walk through the office and make sure all the PHI was put away. There you go. Mm -hmm. That's an audit. Write it down that you did it and what you discovered when you did it. That could be a simple, very, very simple, granted, but an audit of what you're doing. And you plan on doing that, you know, once a quarter, once a month, once a week, figure something out, put it into your plan, document that you plan on doing it. And then when you do it, write it down, document that you did it. And you will find a a lot of interesting things if you start looking. And if you have an outside cleaning company, walk around and make sure there's no little USB sticks in (laughs) in the back of your computers that you don't recognize. Yeah, Yeah, that's a whole other issue, isn't it? Is what is happening when I'm not looking. And that is the key to making sure that things are actually being protected is to look and ask. Mm -hmm. And if you can't do it, have someone else do it. But it's interesting, when, you know, when we go do even a site visit and we're doing a physical site visit, Jason goes uh, walking in a door that's unlocked out of nowhere and wanders around, goes right into a doctor's office and sits down in front of a bunch of PHI. And they're like, well, no one does that. I just <laughs> did. <laughs> How do you know if you're not looking and you're not stopping them? How mm-hmm. do you know? So, you know, it was one of those things of, well, that door is only open on these days at these times. Okay, I just happened to be here that time, you know. So I just happened to know that I could do it. And uh, it's those kinds of things that if you're not looking, that's what's going to bite you. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like I've got all of that uh, trash piled up over there in the yard. And I'm certain there's no snakes in it because there's just not. There's never any snakes in it. <laughs> and then you go over there and look and you're screaming like a little girl running across the yard, you know? <laughs> Not that I would do that. I was talking about yeah. you, David. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> there you go, hacking into my webcams again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know why I stopped doing that. <laughs> so that brings us to step five, which is Not just monitoring, but also responding to those incidents in a timely manner. And this is your favorite one, right, David? Because you yeah, I love this. Yeah, this is the point where we all freak out together. That's right. (laughs) That's a requirement. If you read it, it's in the rule. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. If you hold it to yourself, you're wasting valuable time because if you don't know that something happened because somebody in your office was keeping it quiet. The clock started when someone in your office knew. Just remember that. That As soon as someone knows that should tell you, that's when the clock starts. So if you're not doing it in a timely manner, and it's not just HIPAA, there's other federal regulations and state regulations that require a timely response to something being wrong. And it's not the clock starts when you figured out that it happened. It The clock starts when you figure out it could have happened. So remember that. So you don't want people thinking, well, let me figure it out first. We should all freak out together. Mm-hmm. And this is also where you need to make sure that your business associates know what their requirements are, because if that clock starts ticking, And of course, this is kind of an arguable point I'm going to make here, but if your business associate waits a couple of weeks to tell you, you know, when did that clock start? When you knew about it or when the business associate knew about it? Yeah, there's a lot of debate sometimes on that, but it appears that you can say, well, when the business associate tells you, but what does your business associate agreement say that they must be able to tell you what's that time frame? Sometimes it's 24 hours, sometimes it's you know, five days, other people have 30, which I can't imagine because you've got stuff to remediate and deal with. You got mm-hmm. patients who could be at risk and other problems. So you don't want to wait too long and you want to make sure those BAs know what they're supposed to do, which is another question on that overkill questionnaire. <laughs> <laughs> do your due diligence. That's right. So that brings us to step six. Which if we, if we have something that's beyond an incident and we have a breach, then we have to adhere to a strict breach remediation protocol. So in order to adhere to a protocol, first of all, we have to have a protocol. <laughs> <laughs> we have to know where it's at, know how to get to it, know what it says. And it's a good 
thing to to do a mock breach remediation, even if you haven't had any problems over a period of time. Right. And we did a whole episode on just the requirements of having a breach plan. And in that discussion, it was all about not only do I have the plan, but I have to test the plan, or at least not not a literal test. Don't trigger your own breach. I didn't mean that. <laughs> <laughs> Don't do it, David. But the process of going through it, and yes, once you follow all the steps, the last thing you're supposed to do once you've completed dealing with the breach is go back and say, okay, what went right? What went wrong? What do we need to change or add to our plan? You're supposed to do, you know, uh, what do they call it? A postmortem. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. Postmortem. After it's all said and done, we do an analysis of what did occur. Let's break it down and see the, the pros and cons. And, and not just let's attack everything that went wrong, but let's confirm everything that went right. Mm -hmm. or anything that we did well, but we could do it better if we did this other thing that we learned about. So don't make it be what a lot of times you'll hear people, well, I don't want to go to that meeting. That's just going to be a session. Yeah. (laughs) And we didn't even bleep that out. (laughs) (laughs) It'll be a lot of witchy poos sitting around. There we go. (laughs) It's a breach session. (laughs) That's right. (laughs) It, It is. It is a breach (laughs) session. So the important thing to know is that if you start varying from that, you're going to leave things out. You're going to do things wrong. You're going to skip things that are very, very important and not notify people that need to be in the loop. So Mm -hmm. pull out the plan, follow the plan from the get-go. And sometimes you can build that in. So, for example, in a tool that allows you to build in your own audit questions or things like that, you could build in the, the project plans and the questions you have to answer on a breach mm-hmm. and have it automated. And that brings us to our last one, step number seven. And we talked a little bit about this actually in step one, mm-hmm. but you have to create you know, really open lines of communication between the management and staff. Oh, yeah. Well, we did talk about that and the importance of, you know, top-down process on dealing with anything to do with compliance. If the employees believe that you really want this done, then they're going to do it. And they also have to have the comfort of saying, I see a problem. Is this a good thing? or a bad thing, do we need to do something with it? If you don't make it clear that you also adhere to the part of the law that says you must have a non-retaliation policy, that if somebody reports something, you can't turn to them and now punish them for bringing this up and making it public knowledge so that you have to deal with it. But make sure that all members of your workforce understand that you want this to be important and you want them to report things. You want them to ask questions. You don't want them to be afraid for their job in any way because it'll be better for your business and better for your staff to not have that hanging over them. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I agree. An open line of communication. So to summarize, step one was designate a compliance officer, which is privacy and security, if that applies to you on uh, both of those. Number two, step two was to train and educate your staff as well as your BA partners. Step three was to implement an ongoing compliance maintenance solution. Step four was to conduct regular and complete audits and monitoring. And then step five was to monitor and respond to incidents in a timely manner. And step six was to adhere to a strict breach mediation protocol. And then lastly, step seven was to create an open line of communication between management and staff. And then all these things would be great steps toward your culture of compliance. And incidentally, the culture of compliance is a phrase that OCR uses when defining what they're looking for within an audit and or an investigation. And they also use, use phrases like robust compliance program in the same manner. So that should tell you a little bit about how your compliance program should be set up. 
So anyway, using these steps that we talked about today should be a great way for you to make sure that your organization is following the lead of what the OCR is putting out. Very good, David. I Thank agree. You, <laughs> That's all I'm looking for. <laughs> <laughs> you live for my approval. I know it. Thank you, Master. <laughs> All right. Well, I'd like to thank everybody for listening today. And let me remind you that we are at helpmewithhippa.com. We would love for you to go over to iTunes and leave us a review. And we'd also like to see you on our website. You can leave comments there and you can also leave a question there. We have a little widget there that you can leave a voicemail. It's done by SpeakPipe. It's on the main page. Or you can go to our contact page and shoot us an email or leave a voicemail there. And your question may be featured on a future podcast. Yes, Because yes. we have started the HIPAA Answers podcast, which is coming out on Tuesdays. Is that right, Donna? So take a listen to those and, and, um, and see if you like us those as well. Facebook us. And leave and comments on those as well. What is it that you so stay? Thanks face again. Basis. Go ahead. Tweetbook. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Share us. Face space and tweetbook. <laughs> I don't like sharing. You've been listening to the Help Me With HIPAA podcast, hosted by Donna Grendel and David Sims, the show created to help you with HIPAA. For more information or to ask us a question, visit our website at helpmewithhipaa.com. Neither Donna Grendel or David Sims are attorneys, and they do not offer binding legal advice concerning regulatory compliance. The information in this podcast should not be relied upon or construed as legal advice in any way. Consult your attorney for legal advice concerning compliance with HIPAA regulations.